welcome you to our jointly hosted conference on addressing foreign influence, uh, which aims to discuss the challenges and gaps in our national security uh, that emerge from foreign interference against our societies, particularly uh, interference that utilizes both high and low tech means. Um, so uh, these challenges are too often addressed in policy dialogue without technologists in the room, or they're addressed by technologists without policymakers in the room, or they're addressed without either of them in the room, and, and there's no knowledge at all. Um, and that's why we've partnered with the great folks at Carnegie Mellon uh, University's Heinz College uh, of Information Systems and Public Policy to put some experts here in the room with us. Uh, before I, I go forward, I just want to say, Dean Krishnan, that it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, what you're going to hear in, in January, probably, two things, is we'll be launching a geotech center at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we've been working on the launch of this uh, for some months already, uh, and we have founding partners assembled, and, uh, and we're very proud we're going to launch it, and it's going to look at the geopolitical impact of technological change. Uh, as its headline, but obviously looking at societal impact, economic impact, and all the rest of it as well. Uh, and uh, and uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, is going to be a thought uh, partner for us, a thought leader partner, leadership partner for us in this in this endeavor. Um, and so thank you very much for that. And we're, we're looking forward to working with you on a whole broad range of, of issues. Uh, the second thing, where's David Bray? You, you can actually sit on the, 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 the grown-ups table here, too. So, so, so David is the, D David, David, uh, we will announce in January, is the new director of that center. So thank you very much. It's great to have you, great, great to have you take that over. So. <laughs> um, it's a really exciting, you guys, I mean, uh, this is all uh, under Atlantic Council rules, which is Chatham House with military reinforcement, so. <laughs> So uh, but tweet it out if you want, I don't care. It's fine. So we've got three great panels for today. The first will be looking back to the 2016 and 18 U.S. elections to see how foreign in, in, infer, interference took shape uh, in the U.S. and draw upon the lessons learned. Uh, after lunch, we'll look at how technology and foreign interference impacts our daily lives and how tools such as machine learning and artificial intelligence can aid us in protecting our critical infrastructure and strengthen the resilience of societies. And then lastly, we're going to reach across the Atlantic and welcome the ambassadors uh, from Sweden and Estonia, uh, countries on the front lines of the foreign interference question and disinformation campaigns to share their views and the tools that their countries have developed to protect themselves. I think many of you also know that we, uh, for some time now, have had our own digital forensic research lab uh, that works very forward-based and 24-7 on this set of issues. So what we'll be doing in the Geotech Center on these issues will very much complement, and many other issues, will very much complement in an analytical sense and strategic sense uh, what, we're, what we're also doing uh, uh, with the, with, with the lab, which we're very proud of. Uh, whenever a new and disruptive technology is developed, we are, we're often playing catch-up to understand how it affects us and how we need to respond. And that's why the Atlantic Council is investing so much time into programming like this today that pushes the dialogue forward, cultivates expertise, and highlights the critical issue to decision makers. We're thankful to our partners and experts for joining us today. And I want to thank you all uh, for coming to participate. Um, and please, please participate. Uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Ambassador Mendelssohn, a distinguished service professor of public policy and head of Heinz College in Washington, DC at Carnegie Mellon University. She served as the US representative to the Economic and Social Council at the United Nations. And prior to her appointment as ambassador, she was Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID from 2010 to 2014, where you were the lead on democracy, human rights, and governance. Uh, she spent over two decades working on development and human rights at a host of international institutions. So, Ambassador Mendel Mendelssohn, over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome. A rainy Monday morning. Um, we're delighted to be co-hosting this event. Uh, so let me thank you, Fred, and your colleagues from the Atlantic Council, in particular, John Herbst. Uh, you probably know that uh, in Paris right now, there's a meeting going on to discuss 
the Russian war in, in Ukraine. And so uh, we're hoping some good news comes out of that. John, I'm just mentioning your name and what's going on in Paris. Uh, but also uh, Melinda and Adrian uh, Graham Brookie from the, the Digital Forensic Research Lab. And of course, my team, Marie Coleman and Robin Cole, without whom we would not be here today. Um, and thanks very much to my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon for making the trek, uh, in many cases, from, from Pittsburgh. We really appreciate. Uh, and as you say, the, the, we're really trying to fill a gap here where oftentimes we have policymakers very happily talking about these issues without technologists keeping us honest in the room. Uh, and we suspect that there are conversations, or we worry they're not conversations with technologists uh, not addressing these issues. So this meeting conceptually has a long history. In fact, from the very first conversations I had with Carnegie Mellon about coming on board, we were talking about this issue. Um, so that's, that goes back over two years. Um, we didn't imagine, though, that <laughs> we'd have historic um, hearings in Congress going on at the same time, but there you have it. Um, let me just briefly mention the motivation for this meeting, um, for, at least from my perspective. Um, as some of you know, I spent a chunk of my professional life working on Russia, um, both in terms of uh, democracy and human rights inside Russia, um, as well as on their foreign policy more generally. This meeting in many ways explicitly and in other ways implicitly is about understanding a needed transatlantic policy and tech response to what a lot of us see as the new Russian foreign policy, the new slash old Russian foreign policy. This new old Russian foreign policy involves not only the use of force in neighboring countries, specifically Ukraine, but active measures active measures that include hacks, social media manipulation, assassination on foreign territory, and more generally, sowing doubt and confusion, creating chaos in American and European institutions that we associate with democracy. Therefore, understanding the what and the why, but also the how of this foreign policy is critical. And here's where my colleagues who have spent less time thinking maybe about Russia, but who are thinking a lot about social media, machine learning, and other 21st century technologies are absolutely critical. Um, and of course, Russia is not the only space uh, actor in the space. So around the world, obviously, increasingly, technology dominates our everyday lives. And at Heinz, we take pride in being at the intersection of people, policy, and technology. Actually, Heinz has been at the intersection of people, policy, and technology for a long time. In some ways, everybody else has caught up. Um, but this meeting is meant to fill that gap of having technologists and policy experts uh, in the room talking about the same thing. So in our effort to have this robust transatlantic policy tech dialogue, I ask you to keep a couple meta questions in mind. The first is, do technologists even see the problem the same way that the policy experts do? And if not, what's the difference, number one? Number two, what are the tools that already exist to deter, detect, or respond to the interference from a tech perspective? Equally important, where are the gaps? Where is there more research needed? And what are the non-tech solutions we need to keep in mind, such as the role of public awareness or digital uh, literacy? Finally, I very much hope that this is going to be an interactive conversation um, where you'll all feel interested and engaged and will participate. There is a lot of knowledge in the room from different perspectives, and we want to hear from everyone. But also, I hope that this is not just the first convening on this issue with the Atlantic Council and other interested partners, and that these convenings lead to action and response. We know this problem set is not going away anytime soon. So thanks for being here, and I look forward to learning a lot today. Thanks so much. And I think without further ado, we're going to hand it over to our first panel. I'm going to move to the side.
no problem. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, that's the kind of energy that we're looking for. Uh, thank you, everybody, for braving the rain. Uh, I hope that nobody melted en route to the Atlantic Council this morning. Um, my name is Graham Brookie. I'm the director and managing editor of the Digital Forensic Research Lab here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, again, thank you for joining. Um, we're going to get down to brass tacks, uh, but a few kind of housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, this conversation is live streamed in the back. Uh, there's a camera right there in case any of you didn't know already. Uh, any of the questions are uh, on record and so we will answer accordingly. Uh, but your questions will also be on record just for you to know. Um, this is intended to be as conversational as humanly possible. Uh, that's why we are set up like this as opposed to a bunch of seats without any writing room or uh, us on a stage a little bit elevated. Uh, and so very much intended for that to be the case. Uh, this session will run one and a half hours. Uh, we'll start a little bit with uh, a kind of framing thoughts or topics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit amongst ourselves, but the whole point of this is to get you all incorporated uh, into the conversation. Uh, okay, this session specifically is on 2016, 2018, and what we're actually seeing in the realm of uh, countering foreign influence as well as disinformation. Uh, it is my duty as the director of the DFR lab to give a few uh, framing things so that we all know what in the world we're talking about when we're talking about disinformation or foreign influence operations, things like that. Uh, so the way that we conceptualize this from uh, the standpoint of the DFR lab is A, fake news. That's a topic that we're going to roll up into a ball and throw out the door. Uh, that's not relevant. It turns out it's not a very good research uh, term that we use or that we don't use at the DFR lab. Uh, so that uh, phrase is now banned from this conversation unless it's in, uh, in helping to provide context. Uh, the terms that we do use at the DFR lab are misinformation, uh, and that's the spread of false information without intent. Uh, it's what my uh, crazy uncle does uh, around Thanksgiving. Uh, it's a little bit more pervasive, a little harder to deal with, uh, but the spread of false information without intent. Uh, disinformation is the spread of false information with intent, uh, and a few categories that we kind of consider from the DFR lab within disinformation or below disinformation as we're building out the dichotomies for this group to uh, kind of frame the discussion around. Uh, geopolitical disinformation, that's where we would put foreign influence operations. That's going to be most relevant to this conversation today. Uh, ideological disinformation, and that's where we see a good amount of domestic actors. Uh, uh, trying to spread false information or con miscontextualize information uh, uh, um, in and amongst themselves. I would say, uh, from our perspective, the scale and scope of domestic disinformation from ideological actors is much higher than the scale and scope of foreign actors. Uh, and then last is economic disinformation. And that's the bucket where we would put things like Macedonian teenagers in clickbait news. Uh, the spread of disinformation for financial gain. Uh, just as a matter of uh, framing exactly what we look, what this looks like, in order to not have, you know, a senator spouting off about uh, various terms that they see, and then everything is not necessarily a Russian bot at this point, uh, which is a challenge that I think everybody up here at least has faced uh, in the last six months. Uh, before we get into our panelists, I'll give a very brief overview of what we have seen. Uh, specifically from 2016 to 2018 as a mechanism to frame this conversation. Um, two quick things uh, in general, uh, what we've seen as overall trends, uh, A, more scrutiny, uh, and that's generally a good thing, more scrutiny against foreign influence operations, against disinformation or on disinformation. Uh, the bad thing is that we've seen more sophistication. And so the bad actors are getting better at being bad. Uh, and so our response is going to have to be adaptive or evolutionary. And that's what this group is uh, convened to do today. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation as well, uh, I'll use Russian information operations as an example. But I would, uh, again, note the scale and scope of domestic disinformation is what we've seen at a lot higher rates than, than anything else. 
And there's also uh, more actors getting into this game. Uh, okay, so 2016, what we saw is at this point a historical fact. Uh, there is a huge body of evidence to back up the fact that there was a catastrophically successful uh, information operation that focused on U.S. elections uh, that year. Uh, a few very specific things about those information operations. What we saw included original content creation, uh, influencer development, and growth hacking for audience, which we can get into a bit as well as large-scale automation. And that's where we get now the meme of Russian bot activity. Uh, the two overarching things about that is it was blatant and blunt force, and I would gander to this group that it was more successful than anybody ever thought it would be, including the Russians. Uh, in 2018, the shift that we saw was more scrutiny here in the United States. That's generally a good thing. Um, but we saw what I would consider to be adaptive measures uh, which for the Russia experts in the room, I'm sorry for the terrible play on words, adaptive measures. And by that, I mean the tactics that we saw was less automation, no audience development, not as much original content coming from traditional actors like the Internet Research Agency, uh, and more targeting of specific audiences with existing content in order to drive up online engagement and try to shift that into action in the real world. And if all of those words don't make any sense to you at all, what that actually means is admins of Facebook groups uh, being added to existing uh, activist pages and then saying things like, okay, well, today we're going to go and uh, protest in a parking lot in Texas. And then the day before that happened, the Russian in the group was like, I'm really sick and somebody should take up the loudspeaker. That's kind of how that works. That's what we saw. Uh, two very, very important dates within that kind of very brief timeline, uh, September 2017, uh, in response to a number of the Senate investigations, what we saw was companies take down a huge amount of networks, and so Twitter took down specifically nine, uh, 10 million tweets, 9 million of which were deemed to be from the IRA or from the Internet Research Agency. Um, and Facebook took down a number of sets as well. Those have all been investigated by groups like the DFR Lab, by groups like Graphica, uh, by what is now the Stanford Internet Observatory, uh, CMU, absolutely, which Kathleen will get into in a moment. Uh, but that all happened in September 2017. Now, the month after that, what we saw is similar accounts pop up again. And what they were doing was different stuff. And so where we talk about the shift from 2016 to 2018, that's the moment that it happened. Uh, and then we had a number of takedowns in August of 2018 that were very significant, in which we can get into. Uh, so ahead of 2020, I would say that everything is on the table, which is what this group is uh, designed to solve for. I think we have the right people in the room to do it. We definitely have the right panelists to do it. Um, a few kind of specific things that we need to get into are dis discourse disinfo, uh, and that's the spread of narratives ahead of elections, uh, as well as process disinfo, which is slightly easier to solve for. Things like don't go vote at this very specific voting place, uh, as well as new technologies and where we'll kind of see new emerging threat actors or threat vectors. Uh, what I would say there is I would sell on deep fakes and I would buy on spicy memes, but that's what we're designed to get into a little bit. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists up here with me. Uh, to my left is Dr. Kathleen Carley. She is the professor and director of the Center for Computational Analysis and Social uh, of Social and Organizational Systems at CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, who is our, is our partner in the effort for today. Uh, to my right is the inimitable Ambassador Dan Freed. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of the positions that Dan has held in uh, the United States government because we would be here for a few days. Uh, but as of right now, he is the Vicer Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council, and we are grateful to have him. Uh, over to the left is Dr. Ed Hovey, the Research Professor for Language Technologies Institute uh, at Carnegie Mellon University, and over to the far right, and I want to just note geo, uh, geolocation-wise, but not politically speaking, 
uh, because this is a nonpartisan organization, the director of the National Risk Management Center, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, CISA, at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Director Bob Kalaski. And so, if you're sitting there and thinking to yourself, this is the Star Wars bars of expert that's uh, on this issue, uh, here's what we're going to do. The whole point of this is to get into the granularity of the tech that we're actually talking about and then the geopolitical, uh, the context of which it falls into, the geopolitics, and then what we're going to do about it. And so, how that's going to work is we'll start uh, with a focus on tech. And Dr. Carley, in your work building the Center for Informed Democracy and Social Cybersecurity, the Ideas Center at CMU, uh, how do you see the spread of disinformation from the standpoint of computer science? Like, what are the nuts and the bolts, and how does it actually what are we actually talking about when we talk about foreign influence operations from a tech standpoint? Okay. Yep. So, um, good morning. So, in ideas where we're looking at um, disinformation, we identify it as not just one kind of thing, but we've actually identified over 16 different kinds of disinformation, ranging from those that are trivial, easy to spot, like the sharks in water, that die, that go out there and they're called out and gone within a couple of days, to the more insidious ones that rely on subtle uses of illogic and anecdotal information to support a disinformation campaign. In the United States, one of the most popular of those, of course, is the anti-vax campaign. In the Center for Ideas, what we've been looking at is looking at this from a variety of perspectives. We actually look at social cyber forensics, identifying who is doing what to whom. In this particular case, we're combining journalistic techniques with um, computational machine learning, social network analysis, et cetera, to uh, language technologies and so on, to identify not that Joe is doing something, but that this is being conducted by a reputable news agency or a bot or a cyborg or a troll. We're also working on what are called the maneuvers, that is how are campaigns being conducted, and to that end have developed a new technique uh, that we call BEND that actually builds off of work that was done at the Atlantic Council on uh, what have been called the four D's of disinformation uh, involving distort, dismay, distract, and I never remember the fourth one. Uh, and so we've extended that to actually look at uh, 16 different maneuvers. These are now operationalized and they're in use across a variety of different groups. The point about this is, is that information maneuvers we have found are conducted not just by affecting the narrative, which people are very used to thinking about, but by actually building and shaping through social media who is talking to whom. One of the most effective campaigns that was conducted was actually done where they actually, where uh, in this case Russian influence came in. There was no group there. What there were was a bunch of young men who did not know each other, but they liked to share light porn pictures of women. And what they used is they used bot technology to actually send out new messages that basically in those messages mentioned multiple ones of these young men, which caused them to be prioritized to each other through, uh, say, the Twitter interface, which then led them to follow each other. That then built a community of these young men, all sharing the same images, at which point uh, they switched over and used a cyborg to actually tell them where to go get guns and how to get involved in the fight um, around Crimea. So bots and cyborgs and trolls are actually used in a variety of influence campaigns, and as we call them, like the bend maneuvers. Beyond this, not all, it's also possible to counter those. We've been developing new technologies for countering techniques. We've identified a few strategies, such as the use of satire and count calling out, but a lot more needs to be done. This is a huge gap in the literature in the area. Following that, there will always be some things to get through, and that's where resilience comes in, and that's where we're working on new techniques for doing things like educating individuals for how to respond to, notice, capture, pay attention to, and not fall for various dirty tricks in the, in the area, as well as community-type programs for just increasing awareness on what is the realm of the possible in this area. From this perspective, we've seen a lot of different um, influence and using these techniques, we've been able to identify a lot of different influence in election campaigns and in during national disasters throughout the world. 
We have bot detection, cyborg detection, troll detection, meme detection techniques. And what we found in every single election, both in the U.S. and in Western Europe, was that the bots were not the ones who were actually starting these campaigns. The campaigns often started in blogs. They moved in for amplification into Twitter, where bots were used to amplify them. They moved into Facebook, where bots were used to amplify them. They moved into and utilized images and, and uh, videos on YouTube, where bots were used to make the to cause the videos to trend. And then these things would then go out. In every single election that where we saw Russian influence, they did three things. One is they found groups that were already opposing each other, infiltrated those, and made sure that the conversation got increasingly excited on the one hand, dismaying on the other hand, so that the groups became increasingly polarized and more antagonistic toward each other. This was done even by supporting things that sounded like good news stories, like, yay, Germany's going to be involved in NATO. Okay, so they could increase polarization. Second thing that they would do is they would repurpose bots by other groups. So there's a group of Japanese anime bots out there that you thought were just spreading cartoons, but they were repurposed and used to actually engage in these little elections and to cause trouble strategically. They would sleep, they would come into various groups' accounts, sit there and raise attention by being followers, but do nothing, just sit there doing nothing. And then strategically, uh, during the election would start then not only re spreading out information by candidates that they liked, countering as though they were an insider uh, comments by candidates that they didn't like. So a variety of different kinds of actions and so on that we've been able to spot and so on. Another big area that the research is going on right now is identifying when these are due to like the lone wolf, the individual acting alone versus when they are orchestrated and they represent a campaign that is being coordinated, conducted and organized by a group. Looking at new techniques for identifying things that occur um, by the temporal patterns, you know it must be orchestrated, and by the order in which it occurs. Increasingly, we're seeing um, a large number of campaigns that come in, that come in from the sides, and then start orchestrating the timing of releasing information. And not just one disinformation story, but multiple ones that are linked together and sometimes over the course of several months. So as to create kind of this atmosphere of, well, it must be true because it's coming from many sources and there's more and more information enhancements coming out. One of the big things that is supporting this is the spread of memes. Memes are incredibly powerful. I am totally with you on memes are important. We actually have seen campaigns that have been used uh, with memes that where one meme and then enhancements and evolution of that meme had more effect than all the other stories coming out on the other side um, from, you know, that, that were good. An example would have been, uh, again, with NATO. NATO had the Viking warrior story. Russia had the defense minister meme. The Rus Viking warrior story was well received. Okay, lots of likes. It went across multiple different, uh, multiple different platforms. The meme almost went viral, and it showed four defense ministers, four women defense ministers in Europe, defense minister of Russia, and the implication it was, you know, Europe is weak because they have all these women running the defense. They don't know anything, whereas Russia is strong because they've got a man leading it, and he's in uniform and he understands the military. Okay, it absolutely went viral. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we are seeing. We're also seeing um, tax from Russia that are aimed at particular groups. They're all In all of Western Europe and in the U.S., we saw repeat, repeats of attacks that were anti-women, infiltrating groups, that were anti-LGBTQ, then that were anti-whatever the ethnic group that was causing disgruntlement in that country. As we move into the Ind Indonesian Pacific area, we're seeing other kinds of behavior um, that aren't as, as outright obvious as this. But again, these long-standing orchestrated campaigns. And like I said, we now have technologies for not only uh, identifying these, but for identifying when they come from a bot, when they come from a cyborg, whether this appears to come from a legitimate or illegitimate news agency, when, you've got, when you have trolls' involvement, when trolls being the ones who speak with an abusive language and also try to disrupt things. So lots of language technologies and so on. Before we turn to Dr. Hovey, one and 
one housekeeping tip for this group uh, all to know is that if you have any questions about source material, so if we cruise past a reference that you're like, that's a very interesting reference. I wonder what the actual data behind that is, or I wonder what the evidence behind that is. Uh, there's a good amount of policymakers mm -hmm. as well as academics in this room who would be more than happy to send you literally any source material that you would like. Um, yeah. So please make a note of it. Uh, grab one of us on the back end of this uh, entire event and ask for that source material and you'll get it by the end of the day. Um, one question for this entire group is, is the, uh, the tool or behavior the thing that drives the disinformation. So uh, for companies like Facebook right now, uh, they are looking less at content and more at uh, what they would call coordinated inauthentic behavior. That's a group, or that's a question to get into a little bit later. But before we turn to Dr. Hovey, uh, can you extrapolate a little bit on uh, detection? And, and exactly like, when we say technology is for for detection, what do we actually mean? Is there, like the commercial for Staples, is there an easy button that you can just press that <laughs> says this is definitely disinformation? Or are you looking yeah. platform by platform? What data sets are actually going into that and how do you build computer science around them? So it's much, much easier to detect who is spreading disinformation than to detect disinformation itself. So the technologies for identifying who is spreading it include uh, both machine learning and network science type techniques for identifying that it's a bot or a cyborg, et cetera. Identifying the disinformation itself is very, very <laughs> difficult because if, if it's the easy kind, like the sharks in the water and things like that, you can use image recognition and you can use uh, uh, fact checkers and so on. The vast majority of it, the majority of it that is more influential, particularly from a geopolitical perspective, are uh, stories of innuendo, stories of illogic. They're very hard to detect. And you know, while we are working on technologies there that blend lots of different techniques, they cannot use traditional machine learning techniques. They can't use, because you don't have enough grand truth to do that. They can't use a lot of other techniques that are out there because they're just, each one is a relatively special case. And so one thing we're trying to do right now is trying to figure out what are the kind of common threads so that we can do technologies to support the analyst the, and so on to actually identify them. It's very difficult to spot. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hovey, how can similar, to build on that, how can similar technology be used to better understand and detect and perhaps even deter disinformation from your own work. Okay, so good morning. Thanks for being here. I've just a word. I've been doing language res research in language and semantics for about thirty years now. From in in the group that that brought you, say Google or speech recognition, like when you speak to United Airlines or question answering, like Watson, IBM's Watson, and things like this. And every five six years, a new challenge comes up, like this one, and it becomes very interesting to think about. What's going on when you communicate with one another? How does that work? And in this case, what is in disinformation and misinformation and how do you recognize it? And, and like, what can you do about it? From my perspective, I think these things are so pernicious and so successful because it's not very difficult to do because they leverage the way we are as people. It is the case that we make little bubbles of like-minded groups, confirmation bubbles, and we sort of gravitate to, together, and so it's very easy to find a little group, and as Kathleen was describing, get into it, and just push just a little bit, push, 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 and get into another group, and just push, 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 and pretty soon groups are very far apart without much effort that you need to do, right? It's also the case that if something excites your emotion, whether positively or negatively, you tend to want to tell people. If you read something that's kind of, I, I knew that already, you don't, you don't retweet it, you don't sort of, but when you see something that makes you angry, it makes you happy, you send it out. So the speed of dispersal of uh, information that is sort of more inflammatory is much, much faster and, and goes, and the, the sort of um, pervasiveness of this is much larger and there's been a lot of studies in the last three, four years showing just this, uh, just measuring the rate of distribution of something and people want to now use that to sort of as an indicator to say well something must be wrong or something must be problematic because it goes so fast without even looking at the content. So you, you can sort of say well 
when you step back for a moment, you say, well, how do we recognize what's problematic? And what do we do about it? I think there's sort of basically two things you can do. One is you can look at the source and you can try to identify the sources, and Kathleen mentioned some, some techniques. The other is you can look at the content and you can try to identify that content. Now, the, the sources, addressing the sources is much, much easier. Already, looking at, Google looks at what you do when you type every day, and they make a little word list or a little, you can think of it as a word list. It just says, this person likes to ask about knitting and Christmas and cooking and da-da-da. This person likes to talk about politics and da-da-da. This person likes to talk about automobiles and opera. It's not hard to create a little profile of that kind. Then you can add to that profile and say, this person tends to write at 5 p.m. This person tends to write when everybody else in the country is asleep. Hmm, that's funny, right? These two people tend to follow one another closely. So you can look at the temporal characteristics. Without much effort, you can put together a little profile that characterizes the, the sort of semantic nature, the set of interests, the sort of self-image vis-a-vis others. Do you apologize a lot or do you come over forceful and so on from each, each little actor there? Then the question becomes, well, do bots have a characteristic signature that is systematically different and detectable from normal people? And simplistic bots, yes, we've known that since a DARPA program called SMISC about five, eight years ago. But more and more sophisticated bots that do tiny little things in tweet space are sort of harder to get, but one can still find them. Do bad actors in unnamed institutes in, say, St. Petersburg or something have a characteristic signature? It's harder, but you can probably find them, but they start bleeding together with signatures of people, disaffected people who sit here in this country and anywhere else. So you can sort of create a little meter that says on this particular actor here, I'm thinking this person has this and this characteristics and is in my, my yellow zone, my orange zone, my red zone. Technology can do that with the content, with the people, right? Now what happens? How do you combat this? The authoritarian response is what China does. They say, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna raid your house and throw you in jail. No, in this country, we don't do that. What we say is, oh no, it's Facebook's problem. They gotta switch off their guy. <laughs> that, that's not the answer, I'm sorry. No, that is a stupid answer because Facebook is not, or Google is not capable of making that which is essentially a political, ethical decision by themselves. They need guidance and leadership from the political side to say, here are the lines and this is what you're allowed to do. Okay, So that, I think, is, is part of the basic problematic of going after the content sources, the authors. Now let's look at the other part, the content itself. As Kathleen said, it's much, much more difficult to figure out if there's problematic content and how problematic it is. If I give you 12 documents about, say, the Hong Kong riots from dif written from different perspectives, what you'll do is you'll read them all and you'll sort of say, well, it's clear there was a group of students and it's clear they had this kind of goals and it's clear there was the Chinese government and there was the Hong Kong government and all these and you'll figure out what you sort of believe as the core facts, so to speak, that everybody agrees about and then you can take any particular document and say, well, they're missing something. They're missing something else. But they're inflating this piece and they're talking a lot about this piece and they're using certain kinds of language. You take document number two and you say, oh, they're including those pieces, but they dropped something else out and they're inflating it in a different way. So when you say a group of people wearing baseball caps walked down the street chanting sort of protester slogans, or you say a group of happy students wearing, uh, wearing clothing of their group walked down and they sang songs of protests for freedom, or you say a group of fairly violent, uh, violence-oriented um, terrorists or something marched down a street with, with battle gear on and they were you know, shouting slogans and, and angry, those are three at the core same thing, descriptions of the same thing, right? But they've been slanted in different ways with certain extra nuances added. Figuring that out computationally is not impossible, but it's more work. There is work, say by Slav Petrov at, in Qatar at the research institute there and other places, where people automatically assign what they call sentiment labels to a sent statement to say this statement is saying something from this perspective, this is good, this is bad, etc. And you can then, by overlaying a whole lot of reports of the same incident, begin to 
sort of look, is this, a, is this a greenish kind of a text or a reddish kind of a text or a neutralish kind of a text? Does it systematically avoid greenish kind of content or reddish kind of content or does it give you something, sort of everything in there? Does it juxtapose things in argumentation structures saying this supports this and this uh, and so on or, the, the, or does it not? So there is research on each of these, uh, these kinds of directions. I myself have a student working on argumentation structure all the way going back to Aristotle and, and so on. So people do look at this, but it's very difficult to do. It's not a thing where you can just press a button and it's going to come out, okay? But you can, and I have seen, systems that begin to group bunches of texts around a particular issue and, uh, and map out the space and sort of plot what should be there and what a particular text has or doesn't have and how it, how it uh, contextualizes or connects everything together in such a way that you can begin to put a little meter on the bottom and say this is a reddish text or a bluish text. It's missing this text or it's missing that or it's, it's using words that are slanted this way and that way. In addition, on top of the text, you can look at other texts that refer back to these texts. And around those texts, many times you can say, somebody says, this is a great example of, or this is a terrible thing, or this guy's nuts, or well, no, 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 no. In addition, you can look at the words inside and look at w the extremists' kinds of words. There are sets, there are about five or six basic families of metrics that you can apply to text or families of text to begin to sort of measure different facets of it. Now we, and, and research on this is continuing, and I believe that computational research will not too long in the future, in, in the, not too, in the too distant future, be able to give little, a little bar of metrics, a consumer report kind of metric thing on each text. Again, now we come to the political dimension. Not when you want to, when you have access to a dangerous technology, society at some point says, you need to be licensed. You want a car? Here's how you get a driving license. You do a test. You don't drive, you don't get a license. You want a gun? This is how you get a gun license. You want to sell medication? This is how you become or whatever it is like this, right? Why, you know, you could say you want to get onto the internet and post? This is how you go through training and here is your certification. And now Google and Facebook and, and Twitter and everybody else, you, you give your little ID and they say, okay, now you can get in. No, if we society deem that it is important, dangerous to be able to get into this free infosphere that we happen to sort of nice and, and, and enjoy the freedom of it, and realize there's a responsibility and you need to understand and be trained in your responsibility too, then you can do that licensing. In addition, you can make a little consumer reports bar automatically created on each little thing. Each little post, each little tweet, each document, each blog that just sits there is generated and comes up and says, okay, I think X, I think Y, I think it's too blue, I think it's too red. You want, you want to make it neutral? Press this button and I'll show you, I'll expand this document, I'll push in some other things here, I'll, kill this, I'll squeeze some things down. You can do that kind of thing, not today, but I believe those techniques, the, the, the sort of sources of those techniques are already being investigated and although not perfect, will be able to be usable in some fashion in the next five or so years. But doing them, implementing them, making them work, making them actually required is not a technological issue, it's a political issue. That's why we're here, I think, today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So using technical means, one of the root challenges of this problem is that as a norm, we're uncomfortable being lied to, both personally and just at scale. That being said, from a social science perspective, what we prioritize more than being un uncomfortable being lied to is having our previously held beliefs reaffirmed, which is the nudge issue. Uh, and so why does that wide degree of variance between those two trends cause vulnerabilities from a geopolitical standpoint. Why is that something that, that the Russians, in this case, or other threat actors, or domestic actors, or economic actors, see as something that means that they would like to target, or and why, it is, why is it so effective? Dan, we'll turn to you to, <coughs> to tackle that one. Um, Russian disinformation tactics currently are can be looked at as 21st century updates of Soviet com communist propaganda dating from the 1920s and 1930s. 
but don't take my word for it, read George Orwell about Soviet disinformation in the Spanish Civil War, where he and Arthur Kessler agreed that history ended in 1938 because from that point on, nothing could be ever regarded as true, as demonstrable. And his language is strikingly similar, from which we can all take the hope that we've been here before and that the problem is not existentially impossible to grapple with. You know, where's the Soviet Union today, right? Um, the problem is that the old Soviet techniques have been updated. They were effective in the 1930s because of divisions within our societies, and that hasn't changed. Um, you know, in Europe, the, uh, the Russians are exploiting existing issues, Catalonia referendum, Brexit, um, Greek opposition to the Prespo agreement. Um, in Poland, anything Polish, German, Polish, Ukrainian, Polish, Jewish, are uh, both sides of any of those hot, potentially hot button issues are targets of opportunity for the Russians. And this, this much is pretty clear. Um, second clear thing is that technological solutions get you, actually get you part way to, a sol to resolving the issue. Not the whole way, but it is actually within our ability to recognize some inauthentic behavior. Um, if the solution that the European Union has is moving down through its code, the EU's code of practice, which I think is an excellent start, and I wish the US had, the US administration had something similar. If the, the code of practice is directed in the direction, not so much of content control, but of addressing inauthentic, inauthenticity and integrity of the system, then technological solutions help sort out the different categories of what we can detect. Um, bots, Russian-sponsored content, false front operations, these are actually, in I would put, in the relatively light category of, I can't say easily done, but doable. Harder, algorithm, addressing things like algorithmic bias towards sensationalist content. What does a fairness doctrine look like for social media companies? Do we want to go there? Is that too much in the direction of content um, evaluation? If we don't want to go there, what about standard terms of service? for the social media companies, by which I mean standard definitions of different actors. So you don't have Facebook and Google um, and Twitter all having slightly different definitions of inauthentic behavior and the differences allow the Russians to thread their way through a patchwork rather than a system of controls. Now, implicit in what I'm talking about is that the solutions are, that some solutions are available to the United States government and the EU right now. Secondly, we, we, we are entering a period of trial and error, not global solutions. Third, Anything and everything we do will, at best, bring partial results. Partial may be good enough. You don't need 100% blocking of the impact of, of, of disinformation. That's not possible. That's, that's an unreasonable standard. There is a certain percentage of, the, of all of our populations that is going to be relatively invulnerable to Russian and other forms of disinformation because they're sophisticated. There's another percentage at the other end of the bell curve that's going to believe anything. And then the largest group in the middle are people who can benefit from partial steps. Transparency, identification of, of Russian bots, 
removing of in, removal of inauthentic accounts. Um, as a proof of concept, I submit the French reaction to the Russian coordinated attack on the Macron campaign in the final 48 hours of the, of the presidential campaign in 2017. Okay, the Russians, Russians hack the Macron campaign, take, grab a bunch of emails, dump the emails, use bots, trolls to propagate them with the, attempt, with the effort, the, the, the objective of trying to block the campaign, trying to hurt Macron. And what happened, they were immediately exposed by a coalition of civil society activists, both European and American, and the French media picked up and made the story, not, what, not the content of the emails, but the Russian, um, the Russian campaign. And it was a fabulous failure of Russian efforts. That doesn't mean that the next time around, the Russians will try the same thing or that the reaction is going to be the same or similarly successful. It does mean that at that moment, with the tools at hand existing then, a democratic society was able to blunt a Russian disinformation campaign. Um, so, and I'll end with the, the final suggestion in policy terms, is that work with, between tech companies, technological efforts, and civil society organizations is absolutely essential. And as a cultural matter, as we found during, the, during 2016, when we were in, in, both in the, in the Obama administration dealing with the news of Russian interference and Russian disinformation, the tech people and the policy and, and the political policies people spoke different languages and found it hard bureaucratically to work together which is one of the reasons, rather than malice, that the Obama administration didn't respond until very late. It, it, we didn't respond until December 2016, for God's sakes. Right? I mean, it's... There were a few press... <clears throat> yeah, I know, I know. But it was also, there were a lot of reasons. I don't want to have to go back. But the creating a culture where the tech experts and civil society people and policy people familiar with Russia or familiar with China because the Chinese are, have different forms of disinformation, but they're gonna do it too, are all able to work together. Oh, and as a last, okay, I promise, a last thought. As we're reaching out to civil society about Russian dis and other disinformation, don't limit civil society to groups on you know, the usual email list for events like these or events about Russian bad behavior. Um, Graham and I have been invited to several events about Russian disinformation sponsored by American civil rights groups for whom foreign affairs has not been a principal or even secondary interest. And now they discover that Russian disinformation has something to do with them because it's going to be involved in voter suppression. And they want to, I mean, these are groups with a sort of left of center or leftist groups, and they wanted to know how we can push back on the Russians. I mean, they might as well, they sounded like the Lithuanians or the Estonians or the heart, you know, the, the Poles, right? or the more frustrated people in the EU, you know, in, in East Stratcom. So look to new, we have new constituencies out there who want to work with us and will be critical to exposing uh, Russian disinformation campaigns in the 2020 elections and beyond. So yeah, um, there's a measure of hope and opportunity if we can get our act together. Thank you, Ambassador Freed. A few quick threads for conversation. <clears throat> technology is something that all three of us have said so far is technology is only part of the problem, which we should come back to. Um, one thing that uh, Ambassador Freed pointed out, it's easy to be against things like foreign influence and Russian bots. It's a lot harder to be against content uh, or amplification of content, whether it's structured or just organic. 
uh, of everyday content that you basically agree with, which is a main vulnerability. Uh, we're entering a period of trial and error, which should be pretty interesting for this group specifically. Uh, and anything that we do will only be partially uh, uh, complete, um, which I think goes to Dr. Carley's point of resilience. Um, turning over to Director Koloski, why are elections such a focal point for this issue? And, and turning the conversation to being proactive about what we're doing right now um, with groups or uh, kind of within government. I know that you have folks here that are, are focused on outreach and focused on response. So what does that actually look like? Sure. Th thanks, Graham, and thanks for having me here. Uh, appreciate it. Um, let me step back for a second. Uh, I've been working on Homeland Security Risk Management, we'll just call it that for the purpose of, of this conversation for a long time. And I, I think to get to your conversation, um, our responsibility at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency is to put people together to understand and then address the most significant risks facing the nation's security, particularly as it pertains to, to the homeland. And so we've got a long history of saying, long history, I mean 15 plus years now, of saying there's a, the, starting with terrorism here in this country, there's a risk that demands public-private collaboration, interagency collaboration, bringing civil society, getting the, the, giving, getting ultimately the American people involved in the national security aspect. And if you, th you think of the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in the face of Islamic extremist terrorism, that's what we did, right? We, we, we first worked on our own, getting our house in order across the interagency, involving state and local governments, involving industry, and involving the American people. And how do we systematically get smarter about understanding the terrorism risk? How do we get, go forward to, to reduce the terrorism risk, both on the side of reducing the threat, reducing the vulnerability, and ultimately being more resilient as a society? Um, th that, that's sort of our, our practice from the get-go. Um, What's been interesting as we get into the election security space is we've used a lot of the same concepts, a lot of the same frameworks, and even the same authorities around the fact to bring people together to share information, get information together, better understand sources of risk, and ultimately catalyze an integrated effort to make the, the, the country more secure. Um, and, and so I entered this conversation, I, I was around in 2016, saw some of this uh, within the Department of Homeland Security as we were trying to address this, just as the White House was across the interagency State Department and, and other folks here. And we hadn't done the planning come 2016 to understand when the national security threat emerged. And, and you know, let's be honest, in, in the summer of 2016, what we now know to be the Russian threat emerged, but there was a lot of obfuscation. There was a lot we didn't see, a lot we didn't understand because we hadn't put our feelers out to, to better understand the threats. We, we didn't have the relationships to share information, but we also hadn't did the, done the planning to, to do anything about it. So, so in addition to sort of the policy calculation of how, how forward-leaning should the administration be to go after and, and push back against the Russians and, and elevate our level of security, um, on the domestic side, we didn't really know what that looked like. Um, in, in terms of security. And so a lot of what we've been trying to do post-2016, post the intelligence community at joint assessment in, in January 2017, which, which started to indicate the scope of the Russian effort um, around both cyber attacks and, and social media influence in 2017, is to correct or in, in improve on our ability to work together to address protecting our democratic processes ultimately as a national security and as a homeland security an initiative. So, so that's how I kind of think about it. Um, that then turns in the frame of, of better understanding what the risks are to our democratic processes, and, and we've separated that into two particular categories. One is protecting election infrastructure, the actual making sure the process of voting is secure, voter registration databases, election management systems, the voting process, the counting of votes, the reporting of votes, the technical nature of our voting process. Um, that's largely been threatened via cybersecurity means, and we've spent a lot of time building relationships with the, the, the nation's leading election officials, which are state and local election officials, secretaries of state in, at the state level, state election directors, local county election officials, folks who traditionally weren't cybersecurity or national security professionals, but now need to think about the fact that a foreign adversary may um, use 
capabilities, fairly sophisticated capabilities to screw with the election process. Um, we, we've done that by elevating levels of cybersecurity, building relationships, sharing information, getting increased tools out there, better understanding sources of risk, involving the election vendor community, um, and ultimately trying to come up with an integrated plan to elevate state and local um, cyber election systems. I know that's not the focus of the panel. I'll stop there, but, but happy to talk about that um, if it comes up. And then the sec second element of that is what, what is the focus of the panel, where foreign actors trying to interfere with our democratic processes by trying to pass misinformation, disinformation out there to have an um, to, to cause maleffects on and how the voter thinks about the democratic processes, whether it's a loss in the confidence of the democratic processes, whether it is, you know, trying to, trying to intrude on the way people think about things, whether it's it's trying to suppress uh, voting and things like that, and that's what w w we're here to talk about. Um, so, so then shifting off of some of the opportunity that that it, Ambassador Free just laid out. Um, what we are trying to do in our risk management strategy here is to knit together better sources of information. And so when I'm talking about better sources of information, the, the one source of information where the U.S. government is the best here domestically on is collecting intelligence, better understanding the threat actor, um, getting into the threat actor's decision spaces. So, so whether we're talking about the Russians, whether we're talking about the Chinese, Iranians, North Koreans, or anybody else who might um, try to use these or similar tactics, you know, let's go out and try to collect intelligence against that. That that involves certainly shared relationships, particularly with our Five Eye partners, about that. So we are collecting more t intelligence against this problem. But then the other two sources of information that I think are, are that we want to help knit together really don't belong to us, and, and we're not the best source of information. One is what do the social media companies see on their systems? Um, we, we've talked a lot about from sort of a, a researcher perspective, but, but as, as undoubtedly the researchers know better than I, the, the more that the social media companies make their information available, the more richer data sets there are to, to research. And so having and opening up the channel to get more information from social media companies or encourage more information to be put out so that the research community can take advantage of that is, is a key other element of, uh, of information. And then the third element of information is, uh, is similar to what you all are doing at DFR, what Carnegie Mellon is doing, is, and what is the research community doing with this information to understand trends, understand what's going on. Again, I would posit that we're in a better place as a country if that's being done not by the U.S. government itself, but by researchers who are out there looking at this information. And so if you can knit together the intelligence, the as much operational data, what's going on, and then the creativity and, and learning that can be done by, by also taking advantage of, of the technology to do this well, you start to get a richer understanding of the, the problem set. And then, you know, where we are within that is, okay, so, so let's let's have the conversation about the best. Let's push for efforts to make it less likely that that information shows up to influence any one of us. That that it, that that information is is hidden or obfuscated. That 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 information actually has some influence on on the voter or influence on the society. And it's it remains our theory that the best way to think through what those responses are are through public-private partnerships, sorry to use a, you know, what can become a cliche term, are through bringing civil society and different experts into the room and trying to do the kind of experimentation and learning and, and creating the strategic imperative, the strategic framework, the information sharing, and then trying to knit together folks, and, and this is where it does bring us in collaboration a lot with, with our um, uh, with our allies of what, what we would call like-minded countries, our Five Eye partners, a, a lot of the European allies, um, other parts of Asia, et cetera, who are facing similar challenges, and we learn together through this. Um, th that's kind of how we're framing it, and then it becomes what do we do about it. Uh, there are things that, that as a government we, we want to continue to push out. One, that some of this 
overt influencing, trying to influence the voting, maybe it's time to have a conversation about whether the norms of what level of getting involved in each other's elections is appropriate as a, as a, as a global world. There, there's certainly, we want to push the message that it is unacceptable for foreign adversaries to screw with our elections at any scale. I'm sorry to keep using the word screw. I'm, uh, I'll try to correct myself. Um, but I get angry. Um, not at the adversaries, not at anyone else. Uh, so, so there are things like that from a government side to change the equation. Uh, these, uh, is, you know, as we've known, these are threats that have been out there in different mechanisms. Let's change the equation. Let's better elevate and understand that. Um, working with the social media companies, we, we do want to understand how their terms of service work, how their operational processes work, what they're able to do without additional authorities. Um, what they're not going to do, what they're not able to do without additional authorities, and what they're not going to do. That goes to, the, to having the conversation of, okay, does the, our understanding of where the actors are going and, and what we're going to be able to do to address it, is that going to be satisfactory to develop, to, to address the scale of the national problem? I think we're still in a, a learning side there. And then, you know, the last, the last part is sort of what to do with it. We, we talk often about what we can do as a U.S. government to build resilience among the citizenry to this kind of dis and misinformation. But w we, we struggle with that a little bit, one, because I'm not sure the U.S. government is the best messenger to build resilience, or I'm, I'm fairly sure it is not the best messenger to, to build resilience. But two, what is the metric around resilience? How do we collect? How do we understand? Um, what messages are getting through, what messages to counter. That, that, that's where I see the research, but we want, we want to speed up the research so that we can encourage as much targeted resilience building mes measures as, as we can going forward. So, so that's how I, we're looking at it. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've come a long way in understanding the issue. We've come a long way, I think, as, as you know, a community pushing out capabilities that will get us better to address the issue. We, we've dealt with some of the roles and responsibilities. We, we've strengthened the relationships uh, we have with, with the key players. Uh, right now, a number of my colleagues are out on the West Coast with, um, with the, the, the big social media companies having a sort of senior executive level meeting across the U.S. government and social media companies about operationalizing some, some of the, the work together. Um, I, I think ultimately we do want to get to Okay, I, I laid out a framework, I, I laid out a philosophical approach, but let's build increased enhanced operational integration to address, um, address this issue at scale. So, so I'll stop there and, and, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. So we've covered a good amount of ground here. Uh, first and foremost, how bad actors use technology in order to spread disinformation, how those vulnerabilities interact with each other how good actors can hopefully use technology to spot behaviors and, and technical means of spreading disinformation, uh, what our actual vulnerabilities are as society, <clears throat> and then what we can do about it, at least in part from government with regard to foreign influence operations. And government obviously plays a huge role because we're talking about nations targeting other nations and their processes within those nations. Um, for housekeeping, we are now going to the conversation portion of this. So if you have a question or you want to chime in, uh, please uh, put up your tables like this. Um, and, and basically, 2016 to 2018 to 2020, and are we ready for it? The, the way that we see this from the DFR lab, at least, is, is this is a truly collective problem. Uh, and it's going to require a bunch of actors who all need, at least as a, as a very, very first step, need to have a common understanding of what e each other can do, uh, speaking to uh, what Director Koloski hit on, as well as, a at some point, have a coordinated sense of action or a shared sense of action. So uh, if, if, for instance, the social media companies did something and government did not, or media did not, or civil society did not, then it would not be a collective solution. Uh, if government led and uh, social media companies did nothing, then it would also it would be one of those situations where we might as well all pack up and go home because uh, we haven't solved the problem. And so, this group has and uh, folks from all of those groups uh, by design. And so, if we don't solve this today, then we'll hit on something that uh, Ambassador Freed uh, hit on, which is we'll hit a parcel solution. But I'm optimistic that we can get something done. So, with that being said, I'll turn right here for a first question. 
I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. A first a suggestion, rather than take all this stuff down, wouldn't we be better off labeling it as this has been identified as a Russian influence operation? And in that way, we sort of harden our citizenry and maybe even crowdsource our citizenry when they get used to seeing what is a Russian intelligence operation. And then the crowdsource feeds back to the, the uh, media companies and goes ahead and finds additional uh, interruptions. My biggest concern is that in 2016, I didn't meet a single person whose vote was changed because of anything he saw on the internet. That means that the Russians have contributed millions of dollars essentially for nothing and helped uh, Facebook's stock pass along at a higher price. Um, and so I have to ask um, two things. One, don't we need a metric of some sort to determine whether this stuff really matters? How much time we're going to waste on taking down stuff that just is no effect whatsoever other than raising the stock price of Facebook? And second, do we want to go to the place where we play this game? Is it time for offensive operations against Russia United uh, when they and themselves are running for election? Do we want to go there? What's the moral decision we have to make as a nation? So uh, three common strands of that question. A, attribution and why that's difficult within the soft information space as opposed to the hard cyberspace. Uh, how do we measure impact of foreign influence operations? I, I think that you'll find a few folks up here that uh, slightly disagree with the assessment, and then whether it's a possible or useful to go into offensive operations to respond to countering disinformation. And so I think on attribution, um, Dr. Carley, you might have some thoughts on attribution specifically. Can um, you tell that it's really Russia doing it? Yeah. Or what makes uh, attribution so difficult? I mean, what gets us to high confidence on, on specific behaviors, for yeah, instance, yeah. from Dr. Hovey or... So in this space, it's very hard to do specific attribution for a variety of reasons. One is they can spoof what apparent computer it's coming from, making something look like it's coming out of Ohio when it's really coming out of somewhere in Estonia, which is really bounced there from someplace in Russia. Secondly, it's difficult because um, you because of the use of fake personas. These are not deep fakes. These are basically images and stories attached to actors that make it look and where they've been in operation for a long time ahead of time. Third, they can, uh, you can also send stories directly from your account. If you buy into a service that allows them to rebroadcast your messages, they'll reserve the right to retweet from your account. The, uh, the, the well, point, though, example. is but once, it's, once it's labeled successfully, so. do you want to take it down or do you want to... Do you so, want to label yeah, it to so educate the citizenry. So I actually agree with you that we should not be taking most of this down. It should just be labeled, but it's often difficult to label it. And moreover, you can't count on the labels being accurate. So when people started labeling things as disinformation, um, as was done in the Canadian election, they actually started labeling things that were not disinformation as fake news and started attributing that. So labeling, you have to have an accredited source who actually checks it because if you just crowdsource it, you will get things labeled that are not. It's very difficult. And I'll let anybody jump in on attribution impact or operation or offensive operations. So just a little thought. I, I'm not sure how labeling will actually be made to work. There are agencies and <coughs> institutes that actually sit down and do fact checking on everything and they give labels, but I don't see that the newspapers pick up these labels and put them in the articles that they repeat or that the, the tweet space propagates the labels along. If I read an article about a three-headed alien <coughs> being seen in New Mexico and I see it comes from weekly world news that to me is enough of a label I don't worry right so but it's we do need labels but we need to also make sure that the labels get attached to the the individual facts and that they propagate again that's not a technological thing that's a legal thing that requirement before we get to offensive operations on attribution I'll give you a few very specific examples uh, on attribution we we have a dichotomy at the DFR lab that we use. It's called 12 ways to spot a bot. And if we get to eight 
of those, then we're pretty confident that it's a bot network. Uh, if we get to three of those, then it's probably a bunch of, uh, uh, there's been cases where it's an elderly gentleman, gentleman sitting in Northern England that's not actually a bot and would very much like to tell you that he's not a bot. Uh, and so that's the levels of attribution. It, it works essentially the same way uh, that we would put high, like levels of confidence on intelligence assessments, regardless of which kind of technical means we're actually looking at. Another example on specific attribution to a threat actor was a, a report that we published over the summer uh, called Secondary Infection where it, the behavior, the tactics, the content matched uh, exact influence operations that we've seen from IRA activity over 2016, 2018. We were at 90% on tactics, behavior, content. Uh, what got us to high confidence was a platform giving us the locations of the accounts or the um, admins of those accounts, the users, the actual human users that were driving those accounts and their locations going back to very specific signatures that we saw in 2016, which gave us the level of confidence to say these are linked to the IRA. Uh, and so on attribution, you're, you're looking at a spectrum always. Uh, on impact, that's extremely difficult. And so it, once you've attributed, whether it's uh, either caused a specter of disinformation and lack of trust in institutions. I think that uh, you would have a nearly unanimous uh, viewpoint that creating a specter of disinformation lessens trust. Uh, one study from Pew, for instance, shows that more news is being consumed online on social media platforms, but the trust in those social media platforms is going down. And so how do you actually bridge that gap with regard to online disinformation operations? Uh, but it would be very hard to say that it even even if there wasn't behavior change, which there's a spectrum of, of opinion on, uh, so even if a foreign influence operation didn't change the behavior of one very specific voter from this person to this person or this candidate to this candidate, the specter of influence operations lessens trust in the entire institution, which in and of itself has an impact. And you would have a near unanimous consent from the entire academic community as well as the policymaking community on that specifically. On offensive... I, but Director Kolaski, you might have uh, specific viewpoints on attribution, and then I know that Ambassador Freed has very specific viewpoints on whether to go on offense. So I'll say a little something about offense, and since you probably can say more than I'll say. Um, <laughs> first of all, I mean, a, a number, of, we, we've talked about these sort of threats in the context of hybrid threats, and it tends to be part of a, a multitude of a campaign. And, and what I would say from an offensive perspective, I think we should be pretty open, as, as I think we are, that we are willing to go on the offensive to counter these sorts of hybrid threats with our adversaries. And in fact, if you cross, I won't use line crossing, but, but if, if, you, if you go toward escalation in certain things, we will, we will return. But, but I don't think offensive should be necessarily framed and we'll do the same thing or we'll, we'll use the same mechanisms. And I think that's an important element here. I think we need to push as much as possible in the international space that these are not the right mechanisms for countries to um, have, have some, some level of combat and um, that there are potentially other ways that we can be aggressive to um, dissuade our adversaries from, from a, a scale using these techniques and, and that's certainly an approach where we're, we're taking. Um. I'll, I agree with that. I'll go even farther. I see offense in three categories. First of all, um, I was amused that Cyber Command leaked, you know, about a year ago, leaked its um, operation to pay a, a, a virtual visit to the IRA, which is their way of saying, yeah, we can conduct offensive operations. Um, that is like the, the technical side of offensive operations is highly classified and raises issues of escalation, but it's there. Um, the second form of offensive operations, the two other forms are, are both um, asymmetric. One of them is, going, is drawing up the finances for um, Russian disinformation ops. I'm really glad uh, that we got, um, that we, the, the end of the Obama administration started sanctioning Russian purveyors of disinformation. Um, including the famous Kremlin um, caterer funder of the IRA, who's basically a, a conduit for Putin's money. The most interesting piece of offensive operations is 
not U.S. <coughs> disinformation, okay? Lay down a firm view on that. We're bad at it. We shouldn't do it. If you look back at the Cold War, the various CIA um, propaganda operations were clumsy and utterly, you know, clumsy, risible failures. However, the original um, U.S. intelligence agency operation during the Cold War, which was fabulously successful, was RFERL, which was not disinformation. It was actual information. It was providing basically emigre journalists from the, so from the Soviet Union and especially Eastern Europe with the ability to broadcast n real news back into their home countries. Like, okay, what's the 21st century version of this? It's probably reaching out to Russian independent journalists and helping them. The Kremlin is obviously worried about this because they've just um, passed an, a law escalating pressure against these people. Their anxiety suggests opportunity, but make it democratic, by which I mean no attempts at disinformation, make it information. Um, and this is a warning, shameless plug. Um, Alina Polyakova is going to be speaking here this afternoon. She and I have written two papers on democratic defense against disinformation, which I'll outline um, policy directions. Um, the paper, our next paper is going to be democratic offense against disinformation. So um, we'll fill in these ideas. But uh, that's the direction and an answer to your question. Quick point from Ambassador Herbst. I just wanted to underscore that I'm a big supporter of offensive, offensive operations, but they should be directed at Kremlin weaknesses, and we should not be going after them on elections. We should be going after them on their villas in on the Riviera and their townhouses in London. That's, that's point one. Point two, I agree with Dan. We do no disinformation, no misinformation. But I would give our Secret Services a little bit more credit. One of the things they did... Uh, which was to amplify legitimate voices. I think it was something called the World Cultural Conference or something in the early 50s, which put together serious intellectuals from the West to talk about what, what the Kremlin was up to. And those are the sorts of things we can do, which is actually an elaboration of your point on empowering Russian journalists. Exactly. So transparency in and of itself is a form of offense in some cases. Um, for us, the way that we think about it is disinformation is a form of pollution, and so it would be very difficult to solve that challenge with more pollution. In other words, not fighting content with content. Uh, what we're going to do is take a few specific questions from, from the group and then answer them collectively. Uh, Mr. Painter, uh, Sarah Oates, and then in the back, and then we'll uh, come back for answers. Uh, on a couple of things, one on this last point. Uh, I do think we've been miserable in actually imposing costs on, on Russia for their activity. Um, and it doesn't all have to be cyber costs, to be sure. But I wonder, and this is especially with this gathering, and I'll say this in the next panel as well, if there, we can learn something from the technical community about tools we're not using. I mean, I don't mean the traditional cyber offensive operations. I don't mean sanctions. I mean things like black holing traffic or other things that we haven't we haven't really explored, and I think it's partly because there's been this chasm between the, the policy folks and the, the technical folks. So, so you know, ju that's just uh, food for thought. The other is, Dan, you know, I, you know although I like your hopeful narrative, um, which is unusual for you, <laughs> uh, I, I, I do think, uh, I do worry that it's not really true your basic assumption that there's a group of people on one side and there's a group of people on the other side and there's a vast group in the middle who can be affected. And instead, I feel that so many people are drinking their news through straws that the actual effect you have by these transparency measures, which everyone agrees on is one of the key things you need to do, is not that great because people don't want to hear something opposite from what they've uh, they decide they want from their own community. And so the question I have is, it, assuming that's at least partially true, and you don't have to assume that completely true, how do we deal with that? How do we actually break into those barriers? How do we make people uh, engage in what I'd say is critical thought again so that uh, you know, when we have all these transparency tools, when we label things, et cetera, it actually has an impact on them and they will not listen to these, uh, these voices? That's the, uh, if any of you haven't seen the movie The Joker, that's the basic premise of the plot, so sorry for the spoilers, is that there's not sides of good and bad, but spectrum. Uh, we'll address that in a moment. Sarah? 
Don't know if I can really follow that comment, <laughs> Graham. Uh, so um, I, I have two questions, but I'm an academic, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say a few things also. I, I, I do think that um, there is hope in the sense that there, there is developing a community that's based around the problem of disinformation. I think people are breaking out of their, their discipline silos, and, and certainly from where we are, were in 2016 to where we are today, it's certainly very, it's an exciting time. Uh, to work in the space, and, and I, I think Dr. Carley's uh, center is, is one of those important nodes, uh, the Ideas uh, Center. Um, so, so that's great, and also Russian journalists, there's, there's an amazing group of, of younger, often Russian journalists who have participated in some of their training and some of their seminars, and they're amazing and give you hope. But two questions. One, how much is this a problem of the current environment in which you have American congressmen going on television saying, oh, it was Ukraine who meddled in the Russian elections. So how much of disinformation is an own goal? How much of it is uh, linked to the current environment uh, that we're in? And I'm watching, actually, you can see the proceedings going on on the TV there. And the second question is, if you ask people on the street, who's dealing with terrorism? They would say, and I'm sure you'd be happy to hear this, Director Koloski, they'd say, that's Homeland Security. Let's give them a call. We know where they are. Who's our go-to government group for disinformation? And sh can there be one? Understood. Thank you. That polarization manifests itself, and how does it compare to the polarization that already exists in the system, as emphasized by Black Lives Matter, uh, Charlottesville, the stagnation in Congress. And I wonder if the approach we're given to this, and it just needs some approach, but it's the matter of approach that's not polarized the system more. We, we see that in the polarization of the political parties, in the polarization of agencies, the polarization of the citizens. It seems that the manner of attention has polarized the country much, much more than the infinitesimal polarization caused by the Russian activities. Thank you. Uh, and before we go to answers, we'll take one more question and then try to tie it all together. Uh, the former reporter on me can't resist asking Director Kowalski, uh, what are you doing to make sure that the 2020 elections are not interfered with by Russia? And how confident are you that they will be unsuccessful in changing what would then be what would be the outcome in the absence of the Russians? Yeah. So I think uh, in terms of all of the questions, here's what we have on the table: uh, technical means of response, and is there uh, basic sides in this entire problem, and can we address it that way? Uh, the issue of polarization, how much of this is a, is a symptom of a current environment or how much is the current environment a symptom of uh, wider trends of polarization, which I think are tied together. And then two very specific questions uh, of how the government is set up to respond. And so on authorities and, and response, it, A, is there a place in the federal government that makes sense to house this issue uh, and be the joint coordinator that is either DHS, the NSC, wherever, uh, and then confidence attributions. So we'll turn to Director Koloski first, and then it'll be a grab bag for the panelists. Sure. So, so hitting on the direct questions, which are easier now than maybe say something about the, the rest briefly. Um, direct questions in terms of, again, the way we framed it in the government from an authority's perspective, perspective election infrastructure, cybersecurity, physical security physical security of our, our election process. The Department of Homeland Security supports state and local election officials very much in a supporting role, working in a coordinated manner across the, with the intelligence community, the FBI, um, and, and other State Department, other, uh, other key players there. In terms of foreign interference, um, the FBI is generally thought of, of the lead coordinator on these issues, working in, you know, through an interagency process, but there are discrete lines of effort um, of which uh, different different departments have a responsibility. I think it is a fair commentary that that has not broken through and that is not settled um, in, in terms of agencies and, and federal responsibilities around foreign interference. Um, to your question on 2020, again, I don't want to get too, too much into the cyber security aspects of it, but the, the, the 
information, the amount of information that's being shared, um, both at a technical level through things, um, establishing relationships through information sharing analysis centers, collecting technical data in a voluntary manner for, from state and local systems, um, going out and, and retargeting the way we do intelligence collection because of the priority this gets from a national security perspective means we have a much richer understanding if something's going to happen to try to impact directly our voting processes and we have the relationships established to have conversations about what we do about that if we see and we, we, we you know we we practice this we exercise this we did it in 2018 what, what didn't happen 2018 was it didn't rise to the level of um, you know what, what I would call a coordinated national attack or anything of that mechanism and that has involved industry that has involved the media um, in, in helping with the prep we've exercised all of this and, and so we've thought through the scenarios I would say it like with a lot of national security problems if this is a significant full-on nation state trying to attack our election infrastructure, that is different than trying to do something under a line. We will see it either way. If it's a full-on attack, we're, we're going to have an interesting dilemma. But if it's a full-on attack in, in a lot of different ways, we're going to have an interesting dilemma. And what I do know is we are we, we've thought through these scenarios. We, we've put in place practices there. It's a, so my level of confidence is pretty high in terms of prep preparedness. Um, you know, adversaries always have something to say say about that perspective, and so I don't ever want to say we're fully confident because we need to stay vigilant <clears> on, <throat> on those things. Um, you know, the, and it's already been addressed in joint statements and assessments, correct? The worldwide threats brief, where we say things like Russia, China, Iran is at it again. That's that's on record. But what does that mean for your day to day existence? I mean, it's sharing that with the. Ultimately, it's the system owner operator of election infrastructure. And so we say Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. If, if we say those words, and I won't put North Korea in that category right now, it's then what would the likely means by which they do something and what should you do if you're uh, running a polling place? If you are, you know, putting together an election system, how do you do that? What should be you looking for? What is What are scenarios you plan a, against, um, you know, for the most part? So, so that that's what it means, and then it's it's constant checking on on you know whether that's what's going on um, there. So you know I, I think there are other questions within there. The one, one final thing I would say about some of this, you, you know, what you're worried about the citizenry here. And all this it seems to me that we are well served if we encourage resilience against foreign interference. That that might also encourage resilience into other sources of false information that ultimately would have a, a positive benefit on societies. And so while we spend a lot of time talking about Russia, as, as you all have noted, right, there are a lot of different trends heading in the wrong direction that are making our society, uh, our citizenry more susceptible to mis and disinformation. And I think we need to just embrace a, a long-term campaign to try to reverse the trend. And, and, and that's where I want to be really humble from a U.S. government, and certainly from a homeland security perspective. That's the thinking that goes on in communities like this that are, that's necessary and how to do it. I am certainly, uh, but we, we, I, I'm not the person to figure that out, but we want to catalyze that kind of thinking and encourage it. Which is a great segment to the question on polarization and environment. However, before we seg there, Ambassador Freed, do you have, a, do you have quick thoughts on sides? Um. Director Kolaski is one of the people in the Trump administration trying to do the right thing for the right reasons. He's not the only one. But all of their good work is hampered by the general toxicity of the question of Russian interference and the president's own view of media as suspect. There is, if, you're, if we are trying to fight disinformation, there is a price to paid when the President of the United States uses enemy of the people, a phrase you know, used by the Stalinists, associated with a lot of dead people, and it hinders his work. I'm not trying to put him on the spot. You just remain silent or glare at me if you have to. It's OK. I mean, they know. Um, in another kind of it, look, there are people in the interagency 
doing the work. But in a different kind of administration, you would have an undersecretary public or a secretary publicly taking this issue on. And you would have the administration working with the European Union on which there is both in the commission a body of people who understand the problem and are ready to work with us, and in certain member states a coalition which normally the U.S. would be assembling because that's how you work with Europe. You work with the essential institutions and you get a coalition together. And there's nobody to do this because this administration at the very top hates the EU in principle because they look at it as a bunch of rotten cosmopolitans. So, so, I mean, I, I, I literally just led a delegation of the oh, yeah. interagency with the EU doing a right. technical exchange of information with the EU right. member states at the direction of the ministers, our cabinet secretaries and the ministers. And so, you know, right. like factually, we are regularly working with the EU on these issues at the technical and at the political level. There are different, as you know, there are different policy drivers in, in a lot of these different countries, but it is fair to say both the European countries and other like-minded countries are dealing with some of the same dynamics we are here within the United States. So I do not think we are isolated on this issue whatsoever. Um, again, the, the tension between the political level and, and the security level exists in this whole space. That's what makes securing elections, securing democratic processes a challenge here because inherently these are political systems right. and say what you will about the president, but, but also say what you will about Congress. This is a hard dynamic to do that. And uh, speaking on behalf of the interagency who's taking these issues on, we have recognized and have been given the push drive mandate to go out and work these issues, recognizing that we're trying to inherently secure a political system. As a, as Good a quick for him. point of order. He's doing the right thing. I agree entirely, but still. And to, but to expand to expand the question and seg to the polarization issue, are we outside of the internal structures within government and within the United States government specifically? Are we in a moment where there are good bad actors and bad actors on this issue? So is is this to to make this a like very very pointed question? Are you in a new cold war of good actors and bad actors or a, a, a ideological conflict? And to put a a uh, point on that that leads to the polarization example that I would gander that there is somebody out there that uh, is very very against Russian influence operations and yet doesn't believe any of the science on vaccinations yeah. and so is victim to this wider issue of disinformation where you create an environment in which it, either of those can thrive and so are there good actors and bad actors on this and can it lead to uh, an environment where disinformation can thrive any thoughts from the panel? Yeah. <laughs> so I want to pick up with the idea that um, what we're seeing is not a pure two-sided Cold War thing, that there's way more players. And it's not just Russian influence campaigns driving polarization. We also see ones coming out of Saudi Arabia and out of China. So there's many actors at play, both good and bad actors. The other thing I wanted to talk mentioned was that the Global Engagement Center out of the State Department was set up to actually deal with disinformation. We can talk about whether or not they're effective. That's a different story. Um, the, other th the other thing in this is that the polarization campaigns we're seeing today are, act and those that, that had Russian interference, are actually extremely effective because of the surgical strike approach that is often used in social media. And with uh, all due respect, Black Lives Matter and some of the other campaigns that were mentioned actually had Russian influence behind them and actually increased their level of vitriol and the level of polarization that you had seen. They're more effective today because you can go in at the last minute, you can, you can uh, exploit the technologies like from Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, etc., to make sure certain information is heard and only certain information that it is prioritized and it is spread broader to more groups. And you can do it in such a way that you remain anonymous and so that you can be an extremist leading this kind of behavior and then hide in plain sight and never, you can't be held accountable for it. 
going on to what kind of technologies are there that we are that we could we exploit your question was could, are there ones that we could be exploiting for spreading accurate or other information the answer is yes if you actually look at the disinformation campaigns online what you see is they have a completely different structure than do the information campaigns they are way more coordinated they're focused around creating a series of separate separate topic groups they escalate those topic groups to become echo chambers right before critical events to make them more uh, to make them more um, volatile and to actually excite them to doing things offline the side they're spreading uh, in spreading accurate or other information are actually completely uncoordinated it just looks like everybody's talking with a million lights flashing but there's no coordination whatsoever uh the stories are not they're not they don't there's much less use of memes there's much less use of youtube it and so on so if we just simply utilize the same techniques that would be helpful but i will tell you even then you're fighting an uphill battle because for every piece of disinformation there's thousands of pieces of accurate information and it's harder to run a campaign that is coordinated for thousands of bits than it is for one. Any other thoughts from the panel before we wrap up for this session? Wonderful. For us, uh, from the DFR lab, it's one of these questions where uh, I'll make a point that we reiterated uh, earlier in the session, which is we're uncomfortable with the concept of being lied to. We're uncomfortable with that being a norm in society. But the thing that we prioritize higher than that is, again, reaffirming our beliefs. And, and so until we drive down the variance between those two issues, it, regardless of whether you're talking about an environment that congressional, that basically the question was about actors in an environment. Until we address that environment holistically, it's going to be tough to do much of anything, regardless of whether we're talking about geopolitical actors, domestic actors, clickbait and economic actors, or anything like that. Um, please join me in, well, first, on logistics. You all have the agenda in front of me, and I do not, so I believe we're going to a coffee break, but uh, lunch. we're going to lunch. And, lunch and, then come back in here. and that's uh, fact-checking in real time. Stop. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to lunch? Yeah. Okay, we're going to lunch. Uh, before we do go to lunch, please join me in giving a round of applause to these panelists. Thank you so much. And the next panel starts at 12.15. Thank you.